know you're just gonna move. Like get the camera all set up and then you're gonna get a different idea of where you wanna sit. Is this where we're doing our video? Is this the spot? Hello everyone. Well, I am sitting here with Coco. We're actually on like a floor mattress thing that I set up right after she had her surgery. She wasn't able to jump. So I put like a little guest mattress on the floor next to our bed, but it's kind of cozy you guys. So I think this is where Coco and I are gonna do this video. If you've been following me on Instagram and Facebook, you probably know that Coco, who is like my heart cat, my love of my life, has been going through a lot. And she was diagnosed with a soft tissue fibrosarcoma in May. A soft tissue fibrosarcoma is an incredibly fast growing cancer. So for the last two months, I've been on a real journey with her from diagnosis to surgery, to radiation. So I wanted to make a video just kind of talking about that process. Um, it's really helpful for me to learn from other people's experiences. So hopefully if you are going through something like this, um, this video can give you a little bit of information and hopefully some hope and comfort. If you watched my previous videos with Coco, you know that she was undergoing treatment for FIP, which she is now completely done with, yay. Um, but while she was going, Coco, why would you leave me? We're filming a video. She wants to go outside. <laughs> That's okay. Is it weird if I'm just laying here talking to you guys about fibrosarcomas? You know what? I'm just gonna go with it. It's fine. Coco will come back. Oh, this is kind of weird. Ah, <sighs> she left me. Let me reset the camera. Okay, where was I? So Coco, when she was going through her FIP injections, started to have some sores on the sides of her back, which are totally normal during FIP injections. But one of the sores was not really like a surface level sore like the other ones. It was more like a tiny, tiny little bump underneath her skin. Um, so it felt almost like like a grain, like a little grain of quinoa or something. But it was, it was getting bigger slightly over time. And I brought it to her vet's attention and I said, I don't like how this feels and he said, you know, to be honest, it's probably fine. It's probably dead fat. And I said, well, can we test it anyway? Because you know, Coco's been through so much. Can we just test it to be sure? So he did a fine needle aspirate, sent it to a lab, called me a few days later and said, it's nothing to worry about. It didn't come back cancerous or anything. So I was like, okay. So a few weeks go by and I bring her into her specialist for an appointment and her specialist asks, what's this lump on her arm? And I said, oh, don't worry, it's already been tested. And she said, no, I wanna test it again. By this point, it was still slightly growing, but it was small. It was probably like less than the size of a pea. And she said, I wanna test it to be sure. I was like, okay, gosh, like, you know, I was told it probably wasn't a big deal. Tested it anyway, seemed like it was fine. So we retested it again and it came back as a sarcoma, which was, I don't know if shocking is the word because you know, I had originally suspected something could be going wrong, but I was just upset at how easily these kinds of things can be missed because you know, I had brought it up and I had had it tested and it's, only because another doctor tested it again and got a different piece of the sample or whatever it is that actually made it clear that this was something to be concerned about. So I was upset. And this is kind of my reminder to myself and to you, the people who are watching, that if you are worried about something with your cat and you speak up and you don't feel sure about it, you know, you can always go get a second opinion. That's important, you know, speak up and get multiple opinions if you're feeling unsure about your cat's health. So it came back as most likely being a FIS, which is a feline injection site sarcoma. These used to be called vaccine associated sarcomas, but um, now they're called feline injection site sarcomas because um, these are cancerous tumors that can arise at the site of any injection. And it's not something that happens right away necessarily. These sarcomas can pop up after as few as four weeks after an injection or as long as 
10 years after an injection. So they are rare tumors, but they can happen. And we don't know if this was a result of the FIP injections or a old injection from 10 years ago, we don't know. But uh, that is what it most likely is, is an injection site sarcoma. So these sarcomas are extremely aggressive. They spread rapidly. And by the time we got the results back, it was now, I mean, it was, it was like a little marble. It wasn't huge, but it was definitely growing, like noticeably growing. And these are tumors that can not only spread in place, but they can metastasize to other parts of the body. So it can spread into the lungs or into other organs. Um, it can spread really rapidly. So when a sarcoma is in an area where it's possible to surgically remove it, that is the first step. So when I found out she had this sarcoma, I was in a panic. The specialist was not going to be able to do surgery for quite a while. And so I was really, really fortunate that my dear friend who I adore so much, Dr. Rachel Wallach was able to uh, do the surgery the very next day. So Coco and I got in the car, we drove a couple hours north, we met up with Dr. Rachel and she did the surgery. So she placed her under anesthesia, shaved the area, removed not only the tumor, but a large margin around the tumor, sutured her back up, and once she was awake and recovering, I was so relieved. I was honestly a nervous wreck the entire time. So I was really happy to see her afterwards, but it's a large scar because you do have to take a big margin of tissue around the tumor. What's important to know is that, you know, it's not just that hard lump that is where the cancer is. Those cancerous cells kind of send out um, like little tendrils throughout the body. And so you want to take also the tissue around it because those tissues can also have cancerous cells in them. So the idea is to remove as much as possible and then to send that out for biopsy and to test the margins. And then after that, in most cases, uh, they are going to recommend radiation. It depends, of course, on the situation. Every cat is different. So for her, it was diagnosis, surgery and then radiation. But radiation cannot happen on a fresh surgical site. You have to have time to heal. So she had two weeks before her stitches could come out. And then after four weeks, she was able to start the radiation journey. Radiation is done by a specialist called a radiation oncologist. So this is all that they do. When you meet with the radiation oncologist, typically the first thing that they're going to do is a CT scan with the cat. This gives them a better sense of the case and also helps them determine if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. After a CT scan, if your cat is a candidate for radiation, they will advise you on how many radiation sessions the cat needs. And this was something I was not prepared for. I didn't realize um, how many sessions that can be. In some cases, it might be as few as four sessions. Um, and in other cases, it can be as many as 19 or more sessions. So for Coco's case, they recommended 19 radiation radiation sessions, which is a lot. Well, look who just showed up. It's Coco. Did you hear that I have treats? <laughs> okay. So 19 sessions is a lot, but in Coco's case, the doctor basically said anything less than 19 would be strictly palliative. But if she did 19 sessions, there would be a much higher chance of a positive outcome. So those sessions happen every weekday for 19 weekdays which is about a month of weekdays of taking her in for radiation appointments. So it's a lot, it is a lot. Now there are a lot of things to consider when you're faced with a situation like this. So I think it's really important to say there is not one right answer here. It's a very complicated situation, logistically, financially, emotionally. It's a huge undertaking. So, you know, every person is going to handle this situation differently. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at first. You know, if I wanted to put her through 19 radiation sessions and if I'd be able to make it work. But I asked the doctor, you know, if she could be cured with 19 sessions. And the doctor wouldn't say yes, but what she did say was most cats, like Coco, 
who go through with the full 19 sessions will complete those sessions, continue living, and eventually die of something else. And I liked the sound of that, so I felt determined that I wanted to figure out a way to do it. So I brought her in for her first appointment, which takes a little bit longer than the other appointments because they have to set up the machine to the cat's specific treatment plan. But the sessions that follow over the next several days um, are much shorter. The actual radiation itself only takes a few minutes. So to learn what radiation treatment really is, let's read the booklet from the hospital. Coco, let's teach the people about radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is any cancer treatment that involves killing tumors by exposing them to x-rays, gamma rays, or electrons. There are several methods for administering radiation to a tumor. The most common method is to focus multiple x-ray beams on the tumor from different directions. This allows the radiation dose to be concentrated on the tumor while avoiding normal tissues as best as possible. This type of treatment is called external beam radiation therapy. And that's the method that they use at Coco's Hospital. So that is why Coco has this shaved area and you can see they have marked her with a green X. That is where they line up the external beam therapy. So um, you can see here, this is where her tumor was removed and then they are just radiating the area around it to ensure that any cancer cells that were missed by the surgery are going to be treated through radiation. So here's what my experience was. Honestly, it was much easier on Coco than I possibly could have imagined. In the beginning, I had so much anxiety about what this experience would be like for her. And I think what actually ended up happening is it was harder on me than it was on her. Um, the hardest thing about it really was the anxiety leading up to it. and. Honestly, just the time in the car. I don't live super close to the hospital, so um, we did have to drive there and back every day, which was a lot. Sometimes there was a long wait time, so sometimes Coco and I would be sitting in the parking lot of the hospital for a couple hours even. So it did make it hard to plan my day or do as much animal care as I usually do. I really had to lean into my Orphan Kitten Club team members, my partner Andrew, my friends. I had to push back some work deadlines. I really had to just ask everyone to go a little bit easy on me during those 19 days because it was a lot. It took a lot of time. But the truth is Coco actually loved sitting in the car with me. She loved looking out the window at all the animals in the parking lot. She loved laying around with me and just getting some one-on-one -on -one bonding time. I called it our picnic because I would lay out a blanket in the back seat and we would just sit on that blanket together and snuggle and relax while we waited. So given how sad I've been about everything, the truth is that this extra time with her was really, really special. And then when they were ready for her, a vet tech would come out and bring her back into the hospital. They would place her under anesthesia, do the radiation session, reverse the anesthesia, and once she was awake, bring her back out to the car and I would give her a little treat. And this part I think was really important, was establishing a routine with her. So every single time she came back to the car, I would give her her favorite treat. And I think that that helped her a lot. It definitely helped me. It kind of put some um, expectation and some like pacing on our day where we sort of both knew what to expect. When she came back to the car, she would be quite wobbly, but she would eat her treat and perk up and then we'd get to go home and do it all over the next day. Only your tail's gonna be, do you see this? Only her tail in the video. We're talking about you, the people are here for you, and this is all you got for me. <laughs> oh, Coco. Let's eat a treat and let people see you. Here you go. So yeah, it felt like Groundhog Day. It really did. It was like the same thing every day. We wake up in the morning. I don't have another treat, I'm sorry. I would place her in her carrier. I don't have another treat, I'm sorry. I trained her how to give high fives for a treat and now she thinks every time she sees my hand, she can just give me a high five. Okay, fine, I give you another treat. Come here, come here. You wanna show everybody your high five? Look, high five! Yeah, good job. How am I 
supposed to talk when you're just being so cute? Come here, high five. Aww, I love ya. So it became a routine and um, we both got used to it and we got through it. And after 19 days, couldn't believe it, she finished her last session and when they brought her out, I cried. And now we're done, high five. <laughs> Good one, Coco. Hopefully this is the last that we have to worry about the sarcoma, but she will have to go in for periodic uh, check-ins with her radiation oncologist just to make sure everything is okay. There can be some side effects of radiation, but they're typically pretty minor. At the end of treatment or even some weeks after, they can experience sunburn-like burning to the skin, which you can see here on Coco. But it doesn't seem to bother her one bit. I can still pet her and everything. So if you're going through something like this with your cat, I first just want to say, trust me, I understand how hard this is. It is all-encompassing. It feels like the whole world just disappears and it's only you and your cat. I don't envy anybody in this situation. It is extremely, extremely hard. So I encourage you to really stay curious about your cat's health, to seek those second opinions, um, to get the best advice you can, but ultimately to listen to yourself and your cat. Every single case is gonna be different and can only do the best that you can given your specific situation. But as for Coco, I am really grateful that this was the path that we were able to go. I'm so thankful that she had the support that she needed. You know, it ended up going really well. And this has been a hard year, you know, a, Less than a year ago, she was diagnosed with GI lymphoma, a different kind of cancer. She went into remission for that after she's been on chemotherapy medication for the better part of a year now. So she did really well with that. Then she was diagnosed with FIP. She got cured of FIP thanks to the black market drug that I made a video about. And now it's a soft tissue fibrosarcoma and we've had to go through all this. So it's really been a year. I feel like I've just been standing in front of my cat, like trying to protect her from all of these deadly diseases that are trying to harm her. But I sure hope that it's true that bad things come in threes and I hope we are just done now. At least I need a little break. I just want Coco to be able to enjoy the catio and being in the sunshine and being with her friends and being snuggled. I just want Coco to be able to continue having a loving and happy life for as long as possible. Coco is the cat who changed my life and I'm so glad that for now she is alive and well. Come here, Coco. You barely hung out with me that entire video, unless I had treats. High five anyway. I love ya. I love you to bits, girl.